Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening and uh, uh, welcome. My name is Andrew McIntyre. I'm Dean uh, here at the College of Asia and Pacific. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome people from uh, across the campus community, across the Canberra community, um, and especially uh, to welcome uh, many members uh, of our alumni constituency group. Um, uh, let me begin, as is our custom here at ANU, uh, for major events by proudly acknowledging uh, the traditional owners of this land on which we're meeting this evening and what a purpose it is for which we're meeting tonight. Um, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be able to introduce uh, Australia's Foreign Minister, Senator Bob Carr. I'll do a formal introduction in a minute, but let me first just say a word about the purpose of tonight's meeting. The S.T. Lee uh, lecture is a quite special address for the university. It's an address that we're positioning as our premier lecture each year on major issues spread across the Asia-Pacific region. It's an address that's made possible by the uh, extraordinary generosity uh, of Dr. S.T. Lee and his family. Um, Dr. Dr. Lee's family has a has a magnificent history uh, of commercial and philanthropic achievement. Um, uh, beginning in Singapore, uh, uh, building a, a trading and banking uh, reputation and over time building an extraordinary global reputation for philanthropic, for philanthropy focused on higher education. Um, many major universities around the world have been beneficiaries uh, of the Lee Family Foundation's uh, support. And so it's with uh, special pleasure uh, that I acknowledge uh, on behalf of the college and the university as a whole uh, the gift that the Lee Family Foundation uh, has made to the ANU to make possible the SD Lee Lecture. I'll say a bit more about the lecture and where it's heading later on, but for now, let me just say, watch this space. Watch this space. Uh, and to show you um, uh, my seriousness and purpose in saying that, look who we have this evening. It's hard to think of uh, a more appropriate speaker uh, to be here with us tonight uh, to deliver uh, this ST Lee lecture. Um, uh, you all know the official reasons why Bob Carr uh, is, such a good, uh, is such a good individual to deliver the ST Lee lecture. Uh, as an extraordinarily high profile uh, foreign minister. Uh, his record of achievement uh, over many years uh, as Premier of New South Wales. And the fresh determination he brings as foreign minister today to bring the most pressing issues uh, in Australia's regional engagement into strong focus. For my part, um, uh, I came to know Bob and his wife uh, Helena uh, through their involvement over many years uh, with uh, the Australian-American Leadership Dialogue. And it was through that f uh, forum that I got to see um, uh, at close hand um, not just the range of Bob's international priorities and, and, and passions, but the, his, his extraordinary gift for, for advocacy, for purposeful communication, uh, so I, I think he's just a, a wonderful person uh, to have with us tonight. Um, there are many things you could highlight uh, from Bob's parliamentary career, from his professional and amateur career in, in old and new media. But let me, just pull, let me just pull one thing out, one thing out, particularly for this audience. And that is his uh, accomplishments as an author. Now, just in case there's anyone here who's going for promotion this year, colleagues, um, Senator Carr's written not one book, not two books, but three books. That would be a good, uh, good, good, good basis for promotion if you were going up for it this year, Bob. Um, the titles of the books, Thoughtliness, What Australia Means to Me, and the one that I'm best uh, acquainted with, My Reading Life. 
Now, um, as it happens, just uh, uh, in getting myself uh, organised for, for welcoming Bob, I went uh, uh, to get down from the bookshelf uh, my copy of the last of those books, My Reading Life. And I couldn't find it. So I looked at home, I couldn't find it at home. And then I thought, oh, I know where it might be. And I rang my oldest son, um, a typical uh, university student. Um, uh, he'd knocked it off. And I said, now, look, um, Alex, I, I, I need the book back. As, as it happens, um, Bob Carr's coming to the university and I'll be introducing him. I'd just like to look back through the book. And he said, well, I'm, I'm not giving it back. <laughs> And he said, I haven't finished it, and if I give it back to you, I won't get it back myself. I kid you not. So, Bob, I haven't been able to refresh myself on, um, on my reading life. Uh, in the time that I've been dean, I've introduced all sorts of authors, but I've never had one that I've introduced whose book I've been unable to get back. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Bob Carr. Andrew, thank you for that introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, I would have liked to have known Lee Seng T. I understand that he left university, uh, left Singapore to attend the Wharton Business School at the University of Pennsylvania, and what an enlightened university it, it contained a 40% liberal arts component. So that satisfied his quest for a broad education. I'm told that he studied art history, landscape architecture, and he set himself the task of learning what had happened in the world while he had lived in occupied Singapore in World War II. He spent many hours in that library. At, at 89, he did they support universities in Singapore and Harvard, Stanford, Oxford and the Australian National University. In addition, his philanthropy, his generosity has helped build or restore libraries at Cambridge, Oxford and Nanan in China. A great testament to philanthropy, but in particular philanthropy directed at underpinning scholarship. There's no need to dwell on the way Asia has transformed itself in his lifetime. You're all familiar with the boring economic statistics that make the case. I, I want to tackle it in a different way. Just think of this. There's been no revelation, re revolution in world history that's had the, the massive impact of Chinese industrialization and urbanization since Deng Xiaoping set it in train in 1979. If you look at uh, the industrialization and urbanization of North America from the end of the Civil War in 1865 to the end of the 1920s, the 1920s it saw car manufacturing and, and white goods um, and, and, and a great uh, absorption of people into the, into the big northern cities. It didn't involve as many people, it didn't happen as, as fast as what we've seen happen in China since 1980. In practice, it's meant something like this, that uh, for every 100 urban households in China, there are now 18 cars, 205 mobile phones, 82 computers, and only, only in 2000, a little over a decade ago, there had only been 19 mobile phones, only one car, only 10 computers. In only a decade, to see living standards loaded up like that is a measure. But the, the more humane measures are what has been happening in Asia in education, higher education, in adult literacy and infant mortality, and gender equality. I was at university uh, 1965 to 1968, if someone, someone had said, I've just read the future, by 2010, you'll be looking at these sorts of figures. I would have said, my God, there's been a socialist revolution. There's been a socialist revolution. Marx has been vindicated. The striking thing is that it was a capitalist revolution that produced outcomes like those I'm going to share with you. Around 1980 in Indonesia, Two-thirds of children completed primary school. Today, every child completes primary school. That's a revolution in a short space of time. Historically, around one in 20 students in Thailand, the Philippines, Malaysia, Hong Kong went to higher education. One in 20, now it's one in four. A revolution compressed into a tiny space of time. Um, Asian students are studying abroad, sure, but listen to this. Korean, South Korean students, 73,000 of them studying in the US, 80,000 South Koreans were studying in China. And it's Asian universities that are being recognised 
more and more as they enter the top league. Adult literacy. Take Indonesia. 67% of adults literate in 1980. 2008, 92%. That measures a revolution. My generation thought when we were at university that sort of thing would only happen under socialism. That happened under capitalism. Infant mortality. Look at these statistics. In 1990 in Vietnam, 67 children died for every 1,000 births. 2010, the number had been reduced to 23 deaths per 1,000, down from 67 to 23. Polio eradicated in Vietnam. Malaria dropped by 75%. Measles by 90%. A revolution in life, life expectancy. From 1960, hardly any time ago, in historic perspective, to 2010, life expectancy went from a little over 40, it was as low as 40, to 73 in China, 75 in Vietnam, 69 in Indonesia, 65 in India, from a little over 40 years of age. This is, this is more than the economic statistics, a measurement of the revolution in Asia in our time. We come now to a, a more challenging uh, measure, and that is gender equality. In 1999, 53 Cambodian girls went to secondary school for every 100 boys. Today, 82 girls attend secondary school for every 100 boys. In China, where only 75 girls went to secondary school for every 100 boys as recently as 1991, there are now more girls at school than boys. And in China, the Philippines, Malaysia and Thailand, there are more women at university than men as of now. By the way, let me just divert completely and share one arresting statistic with you. We, we're doing a lot to support the abolition of avoidable blindness in Asia. A very big contribution by Australia and Cambodia. I visited the eye hospital in Siem Reap. I've seen the poorest of the poor queue up for operations, operations performed by Cambodians, trained by Australians, the Fred Hollows Foundation. It's a big part of our foreign aid. I learnt this statistic, speaking to Fred Hollows people recently. You know the, the statistic that follows operations on cataracts in a village? As soon as the cataracts are removed and the people with cataract blindness can see again, just like night following day, inevitably, the number of girls going to school spikes. Because with a blind grandmother or grandfather, it's the daughter, the granddaughter, who's forced to stay behind in the home. You scrape the cataracts out of the eyes with a short visit to an eye hospital, the Fred Hollows approach. And the next day, a girl is turning up at school. Here's another perspective. Better educated, healthy populations are the ultimate measure, and people living longer and opportunities for women and girls are increasing, this is a new way of approaching the rising living standards to our north. And it leads us to contemplate this question of whether the next century, whether this century, whether this century will belong to the region that has witnessed this revolution, the region in which the nation states have pulled off what, what have got to be seen as miraculous outcomes, outcomes that could hardly be dreamt of in 1960. But we've got to quickly qualify easy talk about this century being the Asian century. It could, we, it could be, it may be, but it may be other people's century as well. It's realistic to acknowledge that all Asian economies will face serious challenges this century. There are potential downsides, there are risks. The president of the Asian Development Bank said last year, while an Asian century is plausible, it is far from preordained. The IMF has said there are tail risks of a hard landing in China. And, quote, domestic imbalances in China continue to cast a shadow on its ability to act, act as a sustained source of demand. Feng Wang at the Brookings Institution has studied rising inequality in urban China. He points out that the drivers of China's economy, cheap labour and capital, will no longer be as plentiful. He argues that China's favourable demographics demographics that boosted per capita GDP growth by 25% from 1980 to 2010 are now largely exhausted. 
In 2015, the working age population peaks. By 2030, the number of older Chinese will double to 229 million. Quote, China's dem demographic bullet train is racing into the unknown, unquote, he says. The World Bank report, China 2030, prescribed more economic reforms as essential if China is to continue its success story. It gave credit to China's policymakers for their extraordinary success, their revolutionary success, but mandated a more open economy, better governance, more investment in research, more, invest, more attention to, uh, to environmental protection, and an integration of the Chinese financial sector into the global financial system. China will need these reforms to transform itself from a middle-income country to high-income status. Outside China, warnings are being made that countries these countries that have done so well by these indicators of human health and well-being and education, these countries can be trapped in middle-income status. There's no inevitability about them following Hong Kong, Japan, South Korea, Singapore and Taiwan on that trajectory to high-income status. They could be trapped by infrastructure problems, by problems of governance, by shortcomings in, in governance. The transition to high income status, uh, the sort of transition that Singapore and those other states can boast of, can't be assumed. It is a possible outcome that countries can be trapped in the middle, unable to build the robust governance and the legal systems, the investment in infrastructure needed to propel higher economic growth. There's also another risk, and this brings me to the subject of the South China Sea and the possibility of, of that and other territorial disputes reviving questions of geopolitical instability in the region. We've got to weigh them when we look at possible risks to Asia's continued growth traje trajectory. We're talking here about competing nationalisms and territorial disputes that flow from them. They're not unknown. The Taiwan Strait, the Korean Peninsula and the South China Sea have been with us on this agenda for many years. There have been times when security in Asia has caused a lot of angst. The Korean War, the Malayan Emergency, war in Vietnam. But since the late 50s, for many, and from the 1980s for others, countries in this region have been able, implicitly, with implicit wisdom, to set aside security concerns and territorial ambitions and anxieties and devote themselves to economic development. It was in this spirit, after all, that Deng Xiaoping, Zhou Enlai, shifted China's focus from reunification with Taiwan to the goal of economic growth. Japan's confidence in the post-war world was based on the country foregoing the old imperialist ambitions and reaching for stability above all else. Korea, South Korea and Singapore pull themselves out of poverty by fast-tracking economic growth. They and other countries in the region have benefited, of course, from free trade and adherence to a rules-based international order. For countries following their tra trajectory, Vietnam, the Philippines, and now at last Myanmar, the demonstration effect was overwhelming. An important factor behind the confidence that has underpinned the economic revolution and that revolution in health, well-being, education, has been the presence, the commitment of the United States and the Asia Pacific. Not only its military presence, but its aid, its business investment, its willingness to transfer technology. On the question of our relationship with China and with the US, we've got to be resistant to the notion that there's a binary choice for Australia here. Bear in mind, first of all, that both the Chinese and the Americans tell us sometimes seem to enjoy telling us that their relationship, one with the other, China and America, America and China, are in very good shape. And this was spectacularly confirmed when during the economic and strategic dialogue in China, all the distraction involved in the, the, uh, the claiming of asylum by dissident Chen failed to dislodge the talks. Every observer, every commentator said, that in a previous age, maybe years earlier, a flashpoint like this would have led to the talks being abandoned. 
China and the United States saw clear self-interest in maintaining the economic and strategic dialogue they were embarked on, even when an embassy car went to pick up Chen and take him to the US Embassy. Second, there's enormous economic self-interest involved in the, in the interdependent relationship. There's a contrast between this and the Cold War relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union. There was no economic interdependence there. The prosperity of China and America would be undermined by a period of military conflict or a period of frozen relations. The third observation I'd make is this, the Australia-China relationship will continue to be robust because it's in the interest of both of us to enjoy a strong relationship. We've got an interest in more Chinese investment. That is a relationship being diversified beyond trade. That's why I can only find one example of Chinese investment being rejected. It's still very modest, I should point out. 1% foreign direct investment in Australia comes from China. 25% comes from the US. There should be no alarms about China buying the farm. The South China Sea. We support an international rules-based order. Asia has been at the centre of our diplomacy for six, six decades. We're at the forefront of creating and supporting regional institutions from APEC to the ASEAN Regional Forum and most recently been involved in the expansion of the membership of the East Asia Summit with Russia and the United States being admitted to membership. In this spirit, we look for opportunities to see a peaceful resolution of the territorial conflicts in the South China Sea. There are disputed territorial, there are disputes, there are territorial claims. We don't take sides on those territorial disputes, but we do call on to pursue their territorial claims and accompanying maritime rights in accordance with international law, including the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. We've got an interest in peace and stability and the rule of law in this territory. Uh, over 60% of our exports go through the South China Sea. The South China Sea isn't the only place, however, where there, there, where there have been complex and overlapping territorial and maritime claims. It can often be better for parties to agree to disagree about who owns what and to focus instead on a different question. How can both sides benefit? I want to mention two relevant models. The first is the Antarctic Treaty System. The treaty came into force in June 1961 after ratification by 12 countries. Its objectives are to demilitarize Antarctica, to establish it as a zone free of nuclear tests and the disposal of radioactive waste and to ensure that it's used for peaceful purposes only. To promote international scientific cooperation and to set aside disputes over territorial sovereignty. Under the Antarctic Treaty, countries have for more than 50 years put aside their differences over sovereignty and cooperated to promote peace and science. Members of the Antarctic Treaty System have worked together to conserve and manage the region's living marine resources, <coughs> including through sustainable fisheries and by combat combating illegal fishing. The treaty works. Australia, an initial signatory, played a key role in the negotiation and development of this system. And we hosted the 35th Ant Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting in Hobart in June. The second relevant model is that of joint development zones. They are designed to facilitate equitable and mutually beneficial development, a concept that's expressly provided for in the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. The zones are operating successfully around the world, including in Southeast Asia, Africa, Northern Europe, and the Caribbean. In our region, <coughs> Cambodia, Malaysia, Thailand, and Vietnam were early participants in joint development zones. Thailand and Malaysia entered into a memorandum of understanding on joint development of seabed resources in the Gulf of Thailand in February 1979. Cambodia and Vietnam concluded an, an agreement in July 1982 over disputed waters which placed a maritime area under, quote, a joint utilisation regime, unquote. Before Thailand and Vietnam concluded an agreement on maritime boundaries in August 1997, they discussed the potential joint development of an overlapping area. 
In June 1992, Vietnam and Malaysia applied the same principles in their memorandum of understanding set in place to jointly exploit a, quote, defined area, unquote, in the Gulf of Thailand. <clears throat> in 1999, Vietnam, Thailand and Malaysia also agreed on joint development of an 800 square kilometre zone. One, two, three, four, five. Five examples. Setting aside a dispute over territory, agreeing to jointly develop. With our neighbours, East Timor, uh, we are uh, jointly developing Timor Sea petroleum resources for the mutual benefit of both countries based on groundwork laid with Indonesia. Now, I'm not saying that joint development zones or an Antarctic treaty-style system will provide all the answers in the South China Sea, but thinking creatively and constructively and examining models like these provide a path that deserves to be explored. Lee Seng Ti's life embodies a transformation, a revolution in Asia that can be measured in terms of, of, of longer life, literacy figures, participation by women and girls, a liberation of the region from, from pathologies that, that were part of life there, part of existence there for millennia. These gains are too great to be put at risk by an aggravated territorial dispute in the South China Sea that would create instability in the region, discourage investment, make people think twice before making a commitment in this area. There's too much to be gained to be put at risk and Australia will work with its neighbours to see that every option for a peaceful settlement in accordance with international law including the possibility of innovative solutions that draw on those I've quoted are given an option. Thank you very much. Um, Colleagues, um, the Minister's agreed to uh, take questions. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, so let's agree on the following rule. One question each. Um, not two questions, three questions. Your first best question. Uh, and if uh, people would just briefly um, uh, say who they are. Uh, and there's roving mics that will be passed in uh, to people. Who'd like to open the batting? have got a question here, and then we'll head up the back. Bob, why don't you come and position yourself here, and I'll steer the traffic. John Blackson from here at the ANU. Thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, what strikes me is there is, as you say, a lot of hope, a risk for optimism. But I was struck by your uh, omission of reference to ASEAN uh, and the failure recently of ASEAN to come to a joint declaration and deal with this thorny issue themselves. Um, I wonder if you can find any We're great believers in ASEAN centrality. And uh, we were disappointed when ASEAN couldn't settle on a common position. Indonesia, to its credit, um, initiated some quick diplomacy and ASEAN made progress towards a, a common position. We believe agreement on a binding code of conduct um, is the way of dealing with these things and we believe in the interna various international fora as associated with ASEAN, with the East Asian Summit in which ASEAN is central, no issue should be off the table and we ought to be able to, as a community, as a, as a, as a an Asia Pacific community, be able to talk about these things. Yeah, it is pretty depressing uh, these days. There's a lot of bad news around. I, I speak to someone who 
uh, was humbled speaking to uh, refugees from Syria in a dusty camp in the north of Jordan. And uh, these are people who talked about their homes having been entirely or partly destroyed, about uh, artillery from a sports stadium in the centre of their town firing on the suburbs and the outskirts, people who got over the border with, with nothing, they couldn't carry a backpack, it would identify them fleeing the country and increase the chances of, the, of them being shot at, and indeed uh, all I spoke to had been shot at as they fled into Jordan. So things can be depressing, but just think about what has been accomplished in the Asian region. In Southeast Asia, think about, think about the fact that be, there'd been confrontation between Indonesia and Malaysia and Singapore. In uh, as recently as 1963, those states had been at war in North, what was then North Borneo. Uh, that today, in the context of the overreaching architecture of ASEAN and the network of cooperation, is beyond belief. Think of the, the dictatorship that held Myanmar back for decades, the distorting effect of that dictatorship. And think of uh, a leader of, uh, of Myanmar today who, who says, I'm leading a government, I'll allow free elections, and if 43 out of 44 seats go to the opposition party, that's fine. We adhere to democracy. That's very encouraging. I went and inspected some schools being staffed by Australian trained teachers with Australian equipment in the Delta country just outside Rangoon. And uh, I'm very proud to be an Australian in those circumstances to see youngsters going into school in a country where only 50% of kids got to complete primary school. And there was, uh, in the crowd of proud parents, there was a man with a T-shirt that identified him as a supporter of Unsung Suu Kyi. It was near her electorate. And the embassy official pointed this out and I said, uh, tell him I met Aung San Suu Kyi yesterday. And he told him that and back came the reply, yes, I saw it on TV. I thought this country has changed if a foreign minister from Australia gets reported meeting the iconic figure of the opposition. There's the prospect of the liberation of Myanmar, meaning we can have a zone of prosperity from Assam right through to Yunnan. And to have people, the Thai foreign minister, talk to me about plans for a port in Myanmar. Uh, this is ASEAN connectivity, is what the ASEAN foreign ministers talk about all the time. And uh, a road system right through, connection right through with Viet Vietnam. This is exciting and positive. The region has been without wars, without disputes for decades now. Regional cooperation after the Vietnam War has filled that gap and we've got to protect that. We can't allow it to be dislodged. The gains of peace outweigh the triumph of any territorial victory. That is a big challenge. The, uh, the Pacific falls a long way short. Um, here's one Australian aid project that is making a difference in getting things to change from the bottom up. Bottom up. Very few women have served in the, the parliament of Papua New Guinea. Um, we introduced a program to train women to serve as village magistrates. In 10 years, the number of village magistrates in Papua New Guinea who are women has gone from 10 to 700. 10 years. Now it means women getting to make decisions, getting to settle disputes, family law disputes, disputes about family violence, custody disputes, and people getting used to seeing women in that village leadership. We hope it feeds through. We, uh, we stepped up recently with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and with the UK government to steeply increase our funding for uh, women's health, family planning, 
contraception. And in uh, Indonesia, um, but far more serious than Papua New Guinea and in Pacific Island states, too many women haven't got access to family planning. And we're going to make a big contribution. We, we, we think working with our partners, the Gates Foundation and the UK, we can very quickly introduce another 140 women in the poor world to family planning advice. Now that is a big step forward and a lot of it will, a lot of progress will, will have to be seen in the Pacific Island states. Uh, I was in, in Solomon's on the weekend inspecting Australian aid projects and the indicators are, are pretty sad there. Um, abolishing malaria, which we think we can do in the next few years will be useful because it, it enables youngsters to keep going to school um, and it, it keeps women participating in the workforce. Like, like all our, our health goals, it has in, like, like the eradication of avoidable blindness in Cambodia, it has a, a flow on effect with other social indicators like the participation of girls in schools. Um, recently, the Australian ambassador to Beijing requested a visit, a visit to Tibet, and the response was um, from China was predictable, it was rejected. There was much speculation in China as to what um, Australia's motivation was for, for putting in that request. There was speculation such as uh, Australia being too close to the US, etc. Um, would you mind please outline what, what the what the department uh, policy is in, in that regard, and maybe, maybe what Australia can do to make to open China uh, to their dialogue on, on these issues which they are too sensitive to Well, we have a, a human rights dialogue with China, and indeed it was held with the attendance of a Chinese Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs in Canberra a month ago. It means they can put, put issues on the agenda and put on indigenous, indigenous rights and status in Australia. And we put issues on the agenda, including human rights in Tibet. Um, I, think, I think there's a lot of value in having such a, an organised and systemic exchange with the Chinese on human rights, and that does include human rights in Tibet. Our view is that uh, our ambassador ought to be able to travel to Tibet to talk to people about matters of mutual concern and to inspect Australian aid projects. We're disappointed that the Chinese said no. We hope that when the, the tension and activity of the current leadership transition in China is complete, there might be less nervousness about the Chinese permitting such a visit. Uh, I've, uh, I've also had the ambassador request uh, an opportunity for an Australian parliamentary delegation to go to Tibet, and again we haven't succeeded with, um, with approval for that, but it continues to be on our agenda. Uh, you know our position on Tibet, we recognise Chinese sovereignty, uh, we encourage talks between the Chinese and uh, Tibetan leaders about autonomy, uh, about the nature of autonomy. Uh, we, we, we encourage a productive exchange by both sides. Over here. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, I have um, a high and you. I have a question for you with Australian positions of the such and the six schools. As far uh, the traditions of the in, in the sustainable positions on the one side, also support the, the rule-based order, but on the other side is declared the technical side on the maritime claims. Given the Chinese as a uh, maritime claims in back to maritime zones, the Nagash class is quite expensive and legally ambiguous. So and also China took um, non mutual measures to enforce the claims. So if also in other countries take no positions on the claims, this means that there's a given chance to change to these other measures to deal with the smaller countries. What do you think about the different traditions? 
So our first position is that we don't take claims, we don't take a position on the competing territorial claims. I don't think there is any value that would be served by us, Australia saying, uh, we've looked at the maps of Scarborough Shoal, we've considered the historic material, uh, we've had our best judges look at it, and we're coming down on the side of the Philippines or on the side of the People's Republic of China. That's, that would not be in Australia's interest, and we're not required to do that. But we are entitled to insist on freedom of navigation, because 60% of our trade goes through the South China Sea. And it is reasonable for us to say it ought to be settled in accordance with international law, including the UN Convention. I think that's a reasonable position. And uh, we think it would be a more orderly process if uh, ASEAN were involved and uh, attention were given to a binding code of conduct. I think that's a, a, a very reasonable position by Australia. And uh, we've done nothing to inflame the dispute. Um, we've done everything to, um, to, uh, to um, underline a, the p position I've described. And meanwhile, I've come to the ANU to tentatively put forward, worthy of the attention of all those with territorial claims, um, the, uh, the models of uh, cooperation, the half dozen models of uh, a cooperative approach that could well, and I say this with, uh, with modesty, not in a tone of hectoring or lecturing, could well repay attention. So many people think that Australia could be more to develop security ties with Indonesia, and where you see that relationship in the years? I think the, um, the driver of Australian-Indonesian relations in 50 years will be the maturation of the Indonesian economy. They've now got 6% economic growth a year. Um, if they avoid the middle income trap by making the appropriate decisions, then Australia's economy will be drawn into integration. Just as our economy is now integrated with Singapore, doing business in Singapore is like doing business in another Australian state. Doing business for Singaporeans in Australia is like, unless you're a proponent of the stock exchange amalgamation, um, is like uh, doing business in another corner of, the, uh, of Singapore. Um, so too will, be, will we be looking at economic integration with Indonesia. I think that would be the striking picture. And I think we, we, we have the optimal level of cooperation with Indonesia on counter-terrorism. I couldn't, I couldn't underline that more emphatically. Uh, we, 10 years since the Bali bombing and Indonesia's laid charges in over 700 cases and convicted over 400 for terrorist-related offences. I've spoken to the people managing counter-terrorism in Indonesia and uh, the, the level of coordination with Australia is optimal. There's some pointers to what the relationship might be and the level of comfort with it. Uh, they, like, like China, have uh, issues of territory that are, are core to them. And with Indonesia, of course, it's, the, uh, it's uh, West Papua. And uh, in the Lombok, Lombok Treaty, we recognise that as being part of Indonesian sovereignty. Although we reserve our right to raise human rights concerns uh, whenever we think, they're, we think they're justified, I've got to say the Indonesians have been very, very quick to respond to that. Friends, we've entered the last five minutes of our time for Q&A. We've got a balance between left and right, as it were, and reasonable uh, uh, demographic spread, but it's been solidly male. Are there any women whose hands I've been missing? If not the next hand in the kipper. Well, the worst I can bring to mind is North Korea. I, uh, I dread that one day, when the full story is told, the world will be a astonished and mournful at revelations about the, the level of human rights deprivation in North Korea. 
There may be a, uh, a labour camp system that would uh, warrant description, warrant comparison with the gulag of Stalin's Russia. One day, I suspect we'll hear from a, a North Korean Alexander Solzhenitsyn describing horrors we can only guess at now. For example, uh, uh, concentration camps underground, people locked in mines, never seeing the, the light of day. Um, that could be, that must be the, the worst example on the planet, the worst example in the region. And I'm not sure whether the transition of Myanmar from um, decrepit military dictatorship to tentative uh, democracy, pluralist political system, is going to be of much value to what we negotiate out of the inevitable wreckage of a North Korean dictatorship. Let's give the very last question. There was a hand right up the back. Thank you. I should throw in that Indonesia was helpful in sharing its experience in moving beyond uh, government with a military waiting with Myanmar. I should acknowledge the uh, Indonesian role in sharing the experience of its transition with Myanmar. Indonesia, as chair of ASEAN, was able to speak to the leadership in Myanmar about how the Indonesian military had returned to barracks, about how Indonesia had moved beyond a situation where there, where there were reserve seats in the parliament for the military. That's, that's, been, that's been one of the the political transitions of our time, the political reform post Suharto in Indonesia. That's a great success story and it, it balances the depressing news that dominates so much of what's happened, dominates the headlines, that you, you, you've, you've seen Indonesia make transition to where it's regarded by uh, Freedom House as the, uh, a 10 out of 10 robust democracy with a, an apt, a rigorously free media and, and contested elections and competing political parties. Uh, thank you, Minister. My name is Amin, uh, a student of Crawford at the EU. Uh, I'd just to start by saying Australia has got state in Afghanistan and bringing peace and are also supporting the democratic process in the country. My particular question is, although the insurgent activities uh, increased recently, the NATO forces uh, Australia as part of it has decided to withdraw from the country by 2014. What is your perception on the future democratization process in Afghanistan? Um, will it Afghanistan become a threat again in the region and to the world? Thank you. I think it's unlikely the Taliban would return to power, but we want some ethnic regional balance in post-2014 Afghanistan that preserves the country's sovereignty. What, what, the question now is, can we have a sovereign Afghanistan? Will it be an Afghanistan with a central government that can make decisions about the future of the country in the context of, a, un, under the shelter of the constitution, which guarantees free elections and the rights of women and civil liberties? That, that's the question. So we've made a commitment. We've said we'll continue to be there after 2014, nurturing and mentoring their security forces, their police and their army. The transition is underway. Uh, every day, patrols are taking place in Nuruzgan province, led by Afghan forces, whereas previously, only a few years before, they had to be led by uh, the International Security Force. That's part of a transition we participated in. So that the, the state, the sovereign Afghan state, will have police and an army, including special forces, it can rely on. And then we've made a commitment to, to see that Afghanistan gets $250 million a year for the four years after 2014. And that's carefully monitored. There's going to be, be, there's going to be a big AUSAID presence in Afghanistan. And uh, we've got monitoring procedures in place, because the biggest challenge is corruption. The biggest challenge is corruption. Um, and part of the, the post-2014 settlement, desirably, should be insurgent forces crossing over and seeking to reintegrate with the life of Afghanistan. 
And the United States, this is not a, a whim of mine, the United States has said it, General Petraeus said it, Hillary Clinton has said it. They want negotiations with the, uh, with the Taliban and other insurgent forces. Counterinsurgency seeks to, to carve off part of the insurgency and integrate it with the life of the country. And that's a challenge because there's been no interest from the Taliban and other insurgency forces to date, it's got to be said. I was trying to think how we might uh, say thank you uh, to you. Uh, as I noted that at the beginning, you're an author, so it seemed like a book might be a good place to start. Um, uh, uh, th this being a university, there's, um, there's books coming out of it every day, more or less. Um, so I've picked a very recent one. Um, as you'll be aware, um, one of the things uh, the Australian government uh, has done is made a substantial investment uh, in China scholarship at this university in the uh, centre on China in the world. Um, one of the uh, early um, uh, scholarly outcomes uh, from uh, Centre in China and the World uh, is, the, uh, is the China Story Yearbook, uh, subtitle Red Rising, Red Eclipse. Uh, it came out just the other day. Um, I've, I've been taking a look through this myself. Uh, much more interesting than the word yearbook might suggest to you. Um, uh, not only does... Uh, uh, not only does this bring together the best Australian analysis, the best global analysis, best Chinese analysis, but uh, pulls together the spectrum of commentary in all sorts of media across China, pulling out examples of that on all sides of the debate. Uh, and it's linked to what's now become sort of almost overnight an extraordinarily hot website, pulling in all the blog feeds from all sorts of places. I think this is worth a look. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.